And um, welcome to, what are we in, October, Grand Rounds for the uh, UBC Department of Emergency Medicine. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to those that are um, on the uh, other sites. And I don't know if we have, do have people, can you tell if we have people signed in with this new system? There's a new system uh, for all the video conferencing, so uh, we have people now. Okay, good. Um, but um, that's just a technical thing. Hopefully, we had a few technical issues last time, and hopefully, we won't have any this time. But it's real. It's my pleasure to um, to have Corinne Hole here and presenting to you. Corinne is an emergency physician at VGH and uh, an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine. She is doing groundbreaking, um, world class research on adverse drug events, and not only from the clinical perspective, but also from the system perspective. And uh, she's demonstrated that's a far bigger problem than any of us really realized and uh, working on solutions to see if we can actually make sure that we're doing a better job. So I'm going to hand it over to her. She sees this from many, many aspects, and she's going to enlighten us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Hi, everybody. Um, I like to give interactive presentations, so please don't hesitate to raise your hand. And for those of you off-sites, I actually can't see you. So feel free to just try to speak up when I pause, and Carolyn, feel free to prompt me if I need to stop. Yeah, just because I have no ability to see the screens behind me. Okay, are we barking up the right tree? I, hopefully that's a question you'll be able to answer um, by the end of this, and I am really looking forward to your feedback and your thoughts. So this is what I thought we would talk about, depending on where the questions go. Don't hesitate. We can sort of veer off in directions. If we start running short on time, I'll let you know and, and try to move the presentation forward. So I hope that what you'll be able to do at the end of this conversation is have a bit of a sense of what the epidemiology of this type of problem is. And that will hopefully allow you to have some thoughts about things that we're doing uh, within our health system right now and the safety initiatives that are going on that we are implementing. And also, I hope to leave you with a few practice tips for when you go work your next shift. Um, this is not work that I do alone by any stretch of the imagination. There's a team that does this work. We work very collaboratively and together, and each and one of every one of these people are uh, as important as the other in accomplishing this. Does anybody know what this number may represent? It's been thrown around in the media a lot. Don't worry if you don't. Does anybody want to take a wild guess? Yeah, it's the number of illicit overdose deaths that were reported by the BC Coroner Service in 2016. This number is rising. Not all of these deaths were related to opioid overdoses. About two-thirds of these were related to opioids. All right. My we know the 2017 number know, is uh, going to increase. I, I thought my laptop had a speaker. <laughs> I'm just going to pause for a minute. Do you need me to pause? Um, can I ask the person who was just speaking to mute? All right. I gave you a little bit of time to mull over this figure. Any wild guesses what this figure might be? Drugs that are not illicit drugs? You got it. These are, this is the most precise estimate that we have based on data from five hospitals in British Columbia. It also includes an estimate from one hospital in Ontario and an estimate from one hospital in, in, in Montreal. This is the most precise estimate that we have. These are deaths related to adverse drug events. This does not include the number before. These are, we specifically exclude intentional overdoses or uh, substances that we think were, were acquired illicitly, okay? So I just had one two weeks ago. This is a gentleman who had a fatal intracerebral hemorrhage on warfarin, and he became a brain don uh, an organ donor. So unfortunately, just like the previous number, this number is rising too, based on our epidemiological data. So we're really living in this world that I think in some ways is very, very paradoxical. So we are trying to be better at preventing illness. We're trying to be better at treating chronic disease. As we do that, though, we're spending larger and larger amounts on prescription medications. We now spend three times the amount on prescription medications than we did in 1990. 
And most of that increase in cost is not due to what, what patients go pick up at the pharmacy on their own. It's due to people like all of us prescribing more aggressively. So these are medication use trends in BC. This is not my data. This is data from Stephen Morgan, who's a prof at UBC, who's really interested in medication utilization. And as you can see, there's a rise in the total number of prescription drug claims that is actually larger than is accounted for by just the growth of the population. And so what's really interesting is per beneficiary, so per person covered by Pharmacare, there's quite a strong increase year over year in the number of claims that are being made. What does that mean? Well, just as an example, and I'm using data that are a few years old because these are the data that are publicly available, but if you look at between the years 2000 and 2010, we're seeing an annual, so every single year, an increase of between 6 and 9% in the amount of prescription drug spending that we saw. Why? Does anybody want to venture a guess? I'm going to give you a bit of food to think about here. When Steve Morgan analyzes these data, he talks about six different factors that could be driving this increase in spending that as a society we incur due to prescription medication. What do you think the single most important driver of the increase in medication spending is? Any wild guesses out there? Population. Aging population? Okay. Any agreements, disagreements? Volume effects. Volume effects. Okay. All right. Here's the answer. So you're bang on. It's actually the volume effect of medication. What it, what's happening is we're far more aggressively prescribing relatively commonly used drugs. We're more aggressively treating high blood pressure. We're more aggressively treating uh, patients to lower cholesterol targets. So we're far more aggressively treating chronic diseases. There's a good associated with that, and there's probably also a bit of, of a problem associated with that. We've also lowered the treatment threshold for a lot of illnesses. So the main driver of this has nothing to do with an aging population. It has to do with volume effects of drugs that we're prescribing. And interestingly enough, there's no real price effect. The price effect is actually working in our favor, where we, we're actually, we've seen an overall reduction in the, the cost of the drugs that we're, actually, um, that we're actually prescribing. So these are the two things that are driving this. And this is actually a slide from the US. I couldn't find one that represented Canadian data. But what I would like you to focus on is the far right, age greater than 65. So these are our elderly patients. There's no pointer, is there? Ah, here we go. So the square boxes here. If you look at the square boxes, the blue square boxes, these are patients 65 years of age or older on any drug. And you can just see this slight but steady increase year over year. And the same thing is true for patients who are on five or more medications. And in this category, these yellow boxes here, you can see that that trend, if anything, is a little bit more pronounced over the time period of this study. So we're just experiencing this gradually increasing trend of more people on any one drug, but more importantly, more people on five or more medications. So that's one thing that we're doing. And of course, on the other hand, we're still faced with this number. So we are really starting to see a very, very significant mortality related to the use of prescription medication. So this is something that we really have begun to describe in the medical literature over the past 10 years, partially because we don't collect surveillance data on this or have not in the past. So I've just put up what the rates of adverse drug events or the proportion of patients presenting to emergency departments over three different, using three different cohorts, using three different data collection methodologies. And as you can see, there's no real difference over time. These data are actually consistent with data from around 2001, 2002. And so we're just seeing the steady proportion of patients that are influxing into our acute care system because of this problem.
So based on the data that we have, the best available data that we think is out there, we ballpark that about one in nine of visits to emergency departments are the result of an adverse drug event. And you, you and I, we see this all the time. These are patients who come in with delirium. These are patients who come in with bleeding, intracranial, urinary, GI, wherever. These are patients who come in with hypoglycemic reactions. These are patients who come in in renal failure. There's about as many different causes as there are clinical presentations. And I tell people I work with, you know, when they tell me their differentials, what medications can be causing this as well. Um, and so if you look at just, and I apologize, I used VGH just because I have numbers that are available from there. So um, we see annually now probably about 11,000 patients that come into VGH because of an adverse drug event. Um, if you look across the province, the provincial data, based on the administrative data, we probably see, probably see about a quarter of a million ED visits across the province every single year that are due to adverse drug events. Of these patients, about 35% get admitted, and on average, they'll spend six days in hospital. So you can see that the, the economic burden of this problem is actually very, very substantial on a health system level. Now, what's causing this? And I'll show you a little bit more detail around this, but I'm just going to give away to you that the top three categories are the top three things that are bringing patients into our acute care system. So the paradox is really simple. It's the fact that as we use more and more medication to treat and hopefully prevent chronic disease, we're also seeing the adverse events of what we're doing. It makes a lot of sense. It's quite logical. And so... The real conundrum that I find myself faced with almost daily is, you know, where's the risk-benefit ratio? And it's really, really difficult to, um, to, to understand that for each and every patient that we see. It's not an easy decision. So as you know, in the Lower Mainland, we, we're committed to improving medication safety. This is not a slide that I have made up. This is a slide about CST and what the drivers and goals of the Clinical and Systems Transformation Project are. And as you can see, and I was not involved in any way, shape, or form of determining this, but the number one priority and goal is to reduce medication-related adverse events. So with that in mind, this was the year I started medical school. David Bates, I don't know who knows of David Bates. He's a very famous internist who practiced out of Harvard. I think he actually still practices there. But he's one of the first people that actually identified this problem among hospitalized patients. And he said in 1995 that part of the issue is, is that we really haven't invested in understanding the cause of the problem. We don't really understand it. We know that these things are iatrogenic, that physicians and nurses and pharmacists, we contribute to this, but we don't fully understand the causes. And interestingly enough, as he published this in JAMA, he was also one of the, the godfathers or, or grandfathers of what we call computerized physician order entry. So now it's called computerized practitioner order entry? Provider. Provider, thank you. Order entry, to be more broad, because we now have nurse practitioners and other people that can be prescribing. But essentially what it is, do people know what CPOE is? So essentially what it is, it's an electronic data entry where you order a prescription electronically. So hopefully everybody can read what you've actually entered into the computer. Um, hopefully there's a certain dosing range that's set. So it really the system should prevent you from ordering 125 milligrams of digoxin and should only allow you to order in micrograms. So it prevents um, errors at the ordering and transcribing phase. And a big part of it is trying to make sure that the right patient gets the right drug using the right route at the right time. So the five rights of medication administration. And then there's often a drug interaction check that's applied to that. The drug interaction checks are often not very successful. And they're not very successful generally because they're very generic. So I'm told that the McKesson system at Lionsgate flags every single time you try to put a patient on probenicid and ANSEF because those two medications interact, but of course that's why we use those two medications together. So it's very easy to just go delete, 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 because a lot of times the interactions is not clinically significant. 
Now, it's really interesting. So we have treated CPOE as if this is the answer to all of our problems. But the success and whether or not that will make any kind of difference within a medical system that sees so many adverse drug events, it relies on this very, very strong assumption that most of our ADEs are being caused by errors in any one of these stages of when we prescribe or dispense medication. And that's a really, really big assumption to make. Now, if you look at the actual studies and you look at systematic reviews that have evaluated CPOE, they've shown a reduction in error, but those of you who have been involved in patient safety know that fortunately, most errors are actually caught by, by care providers. Most of the time, a smart nurse, rather than opening up 100 vials of digoxin, will sort of go, wait a minute, let me look this up before I order 100 vials. And fortunately, most of the, I'm not recommending that we make errors, but fortunately, a lot of times we can catch those errors. So a small minority of errors make it into really bad adverse drug events. But when they do, they're highly, highly publicized. And we're very afraid of making them because of, for medical legal reasons. So when you look at studies that look at patient-oriented outcomes, which is adverse drug events, actual events that harm patients, there's actually no difference when you implement CPOE interventions. And if you look at preventable adverse drug events, going, well, there's no way I'm going to prevent non-preventable stuff, but even preventable ADEs, there's actually no strong evidence that it actually prevents preventable ADEs. Another medication safety intervention that we have been voluntold to adapt in the last 10 years is medication reconciliation. Who knows what medication reconciliation is? Yay, a few people. <laughs> what it is, and it's nuts and bolts, is trying to prevent errors when patients transition from one care environment to another. Errors that are made because we don't really look up what the patient was on because we don't fully understand how the patient was taking the medication. So we don't reorder the medication properly. We reorder the wrong drug or we reorder the wrong dose. And so, again, we've spent a huge amount of effort within our health systems trying to implement an intervention called medication reconciliation. Now, again, the success of this intervention depends on whether or not adverse drug events are being caused by errors at this stage in the medication ordering, transcribing, and dispensing phases. So, if you look at the systematic reviews on medication reconciliation, there's two systematic reviews. They have conflicting, uh, they've produced conflicting conclusions, but largely there's no strong evidence to suggest that medication reconciliation has significantly improved patient-oriented outcomes. So this is the data that I was alluding to before. And in blue, I've highlighted the types of adverse drug events. Now, in these data, I've only counted, so all of these patients, these adverse drug events are ones that come into our acute care sector. And so by definition, as a taxpayer, I care about them because all of us are paying for these emergency department visits. And about 85% of these are what we would call clinically significant. The physician feels that a change needs to be made in the medications and or they require hospital admission or a change in medical management. And as you can see, a small minority of these types of events are caused by actual errors. In fact, I could count them off of one hand, the number of errors that were amenable to either a CPOE intervention or a MedRec intervention in our latest study. There was exactly one patient that took another patient's medications. So in terms of the right patient, there was exactly one case of that in our latest data. So just trying to graphically represent that, we're going after the red slice of the pie by implementing CPOE and MedRec. So in June of 2016, we got a call from Health Canada, and we were really excited by it because it's the first time that an institution like Health Canada said, okay, rather than mining administrative data to see whether drug A is better than drug B and whether we should push drug A in our guidelines as opposed to drug B, they said, you know what, we actually want you to just look at a whole range of events and try to figure out whether or not they were preventable and how. And so what we proposed to do was really a, a quite a simple chart review study because it's the only methodology that we could really use to get at this. It's really, really costly to follow patients prospectively who are put on medications because 
You have to follow all the patients who don't develop adverse drug events along with the patients who do follow adverse drug events. So it's really a prohibitive study to do prospectively. So we wanted to look at the preventability and contributing factors of adverse, dr of adverse drug events that made it into the emergency department. And Health Canada wanted to know that to start developing more effective preventative strategies. So we really split it up into three objectives. And what we took is we took data from three previous cohorts. Some of you may have participated in our clinical decision rule derivation study or in our clinical decision rule validation study where we prospectively collected data about patients who were coming into emergency departments. And some of you may have participated in the ADE screening program that ran at Lionsgate and VGH Richmond. We, it unfortunately didn't work out at St. Paul's, but at those hospitals over about a two-year period. So we took, we knew who those patients were. We'd identified them in our research databases. And I'm just going to go back to the enrollment of these patients at the outset so you understand how the data were collected. At the time we ran these studies, each and every patient was seen by a pharmacist, and we knew what the pharmacist thought of the patient's presentation. And in two of the cohorts, we also knew what the physician thought. And any cases in which the pharmacist or the physician disagreed, they went to a formal adjudication. And the main reason for getting the physician involved is we, didn't, we wanted to make sure the pharmacists weren't just calling everything adverse drug events to which we were able to identify an alternative diagnosis. So from these cohorts, we had cases that we thought were what we called suspect adverse drug events. And from the ADE screening cohort, we actually, for that cohort, we had a little bit less funding available and we couldn't actually collect the emergency physician diagnosis. So we had suspect ADEs, but we needed to go back and make sure that these patients didn't have an alternative diagnosis. So what we did is we did a structured medical record review. And basically the first thing that we did is we tossed out everybody who had an alternative diagnosis. Any alternative diagnosis identified by either the pharmacist or then subsequently by the physician. And then we used several different algorithms to identify, well, was this actually preventable or not? In retrospect, keep that in mind, please. And then also we had found in the literature this report of this problem that we're calling repeat ADEs where the patient may have actually already suffered from the same adverse event as they're coming in with. So we had an outcome ascertainment protocol and what we did is we tried our very best to use as explicit definitions as possible. It didn't always work but we tried very hard to stick to these. And just to give you a hunch of these preventability definitions, one was very sort of practice-based is was treatment according to what the guidelines that would be out there. Um, Health Canada wanted us to look for errors, not surprising, that's what we focused on in the last 20 years, and modifiable risk factors. And the third one was this very sort of um, question-based algorithm. Did you identify a repeat event? Did the patient previously have an allergy? And we'd go down this, this pathway. So in terms of who this study was on, we had about, we had almost 14,000 patients drawn from uh, four hospitals and we had about 3,000 patients where the pharmacist said, ah, there may be something going on here. From those, the pharmacist, when they first reviewed the chart, said, you know what, more than half of those, they've got an alternative diagnosis, we're going to toss those out. And in about 95, when people like Frank and me and Diane Villani reviewed the chart, um, we said, you know what, this is probably not an adverse drug event. So the cohort is about 1,200 patients. This was the, these were just the main results of the cohort. So on average, the patients were about 65 years old. About a third of them were elderly, which is sort of in keeping with what we think in terms of adverse drug events. They're generally an older patient population, and a lot of them have chronic diseases like hypertension, atrial fibrillation, a lot of mental health diagnoses. So none of these sort of factors are really surprising. And what we found is really consistent with what we'd previously found. These types of presentations are driven by what we would call adverse drug reactions, things like delirium due to medications, bleeding events due to medications, hypoglycemic events, renal failure. Note that they're not driven by allergies, which cause less than 1% of these presentations. In this cohort, there's a little bit of more of a dosing issue and non-compliance. About 31% of them were severe, meaning that they were life-threatening or they required hospital admission. 
the mortality rate was between 1% and 2%. I can't remember the exact figure. I think it was 1.7%. And about 33% of these required a major intervention, like a surgical intervention. Um, they required admission to an ICU or to an monitored setting, at least temporarily. And the interesting thing that I found, and this was data that was collected by our pharmacist that we're actually going over again, but in a lot of these presentations, the pharmacist sort of felt that, you know what, if the patient had been given more clear instructions as to either how to take the drug or what to look out for, this could have potentially been avoided. Now, the problem here, of course, is hindsight bias, because we're looking at the chart in hindsight knowing that an adverse drug event occurred. So that's a limitation in this, but we thought that that was quite interesting. And then the other thing that we learned really quickly is that doctors and their secretaries think in terms of weeks, and they generally think in terms of two-week intervals. And so if you start a patient on a beta blocker, generally the patient won't get seen. The, the earliest they'll get seen again is at a week. They won't get their heart rate and their blood pressure reassessed before a week. And a lot of times it's actually two weeks. So if you're starting medications that can drop people's blood pressure, you know, that medication will take effect within hours. Yet these patients are actually not being reassessed within that time frame, which was really interesting. And a lot of times it was felt that that actually contributed to that subsequent patient's fall or syncopal episode or broken hip. Um, so regardless of what preventability definition that we used, we thought about roughly two-thirds of these events were, in retrospect, potentially preventable. And you can see that we had reasonable cap is not fantastic, not terrible, but they were within a reasonable range. And the interesting thing is that when you looked at what we thought could potentially be preventable, a lot of them were adherence issues where people thought, really, you forgot your seizure medication again? And then they came in seizing. So things like adherence issues that led to repeat presentations. Um, dosing issues were common where people were just too aggressively treated with medications. And the other thing is we saw a fair bit of untreated indication. And the best example I can think of is in, in this realm is patients who uh, have AFib, known AFib, hypertension, are elderly and are not on appropriate preventative therapy despite no contraindication to it. Okay? So things, people who are known AFib and they're not on a NOAC or warfarin. So not surprisingly, the medications or the ADEs that were associated with events that we thought were potentially preventable, these are things that we commonly prescribe. It's not the weird and fun, wonderful or super expensive drug against you know, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It's, it's actually stuff that we see all the time. So it's the anticoagulants. Hydrochlorothiazide always features very prominently. It's the first-line agent for hypertension in the elderly. And so what we see a ton of is hyponatremia. And we admit a lot of patients due to delirium or problems related to hyponatremia. So the other thing that was really interesting was really a lot of use of atypical antipsychotics, which are contraindicated because of the risk associated with delirium. It's all over all of the newest guidelines in geriatric prescribing. There's still a very prominent use of atypical antipsychotics, particularly in that patient population. And the thiazide diuretics is what I just told you with hydrochlorothiazide and the, the diuretics that we were seeing. So when we looked at factors associated with presenting to the emergency department with at least a preventable adverse drug event, it was generally patients who had the diagnosis of diabetes and those who had a mental health diagnosis. Again, not really surprising, but these are high-risk patients for this type of a problem. And when we looked at preventable adverse drug events by the type of event that they were presenting with, the people who presented with non-adherence and adverse drug reactions, those were the ones in whom we really felt strongly that perhaps better instruction could or may have helped avoid the event that the patient presented with. Again, keep in mind we don't have access to the GP notes or the notes of the prescriber who actually prescribed it. Um, when there was a dosing issue, and I'm thinking especially of our warfarin clients, we often felt that inadequate or delayed laboratory monitoring, I mean, sometimes patients had their labs drawn two weeks after they started on warfarin, and their r, &R was eight. We had one spontaneous intraperitoneal bleed that was admitted to the ICU. So these were not all innocuous elevated INRs. 
These were actually, some of these were very significant. So this is just to give you a sense of among non-adherent patients that this just illustrates how these different types of contributing factors ranked with regards to one another. Now, this was perhaps for me the most interesting result. So when Stephanie, our pharmacist, one of the questions that you had to ask or that you had to answer in one of our preventability algorithms was, did this adverse event ever happen before? So what we got from medical records is we got generally one volume of the hospital records. So if the patient presented a VGH, we only got VGH's record, even though the patient had probably already been to other outlying hospitals. And when the patient presented to St. Paul's, we got St. Paul's record. Sometimes we got multiple volumes, usually we only got one. And flipping through what was available at medical records, she identified that 28% of all the patients that came into one of our EDs with an adverse drug event had previously already had that adverse drug event before. And that, we thought, was a very, very sobering reflection on whether or not we're dealing with this problem perhaps in the best way we could. So I now tell my residents that the most preventable adverse drug event is the one that's already happened before. Forget about errors. Forget about, you know, yes, I'd like you to write legibly. Yes, please, you know, prescribe in the correct dose. But the, by far and away, the most, important error, the most important adverse drug event that you can try to help prevent is probably the one that's already happened. Um, and interestingly enough, of those events, 80% were preventable. So what I mean by that, uh, one of my best friends was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 41. Um, so she suffered from multiple toxicities related to her chemotherapeutic agents and had febrile neutropenia. We would not call that a preventable adverse drug event if she gets re-exposed to her chemotherapeutic agents because that's a very intentional, deliberate, and indicated re-exposure. What I'm talking about here are people who, for example, uh, were given an anti-inflammatory to treat some musculoskeletal pain, had a GI bleed, and then three years later were diagnosed with gout by a different care provider and then were restarted on an anti-inflammatory and had a recurrent GI bleed. So not necessarily medications that had a strong indication for being prescribed, but medications that were simply prescribed in the absence of the knowledge of the previous history of what had happened to the patient. And interestingly enough, when we looked at these, this is just kind of shows you the distribution of the types of events that presented as repeat events. So interestingly enough, there's a lot of just pure and simple adverse drug reactions. Again, these are not allergies. We tend to focus on allergies. We love allergies. When you, know, you look at an EMR, allergies is like one of the first fields that, that you look at when you think about medication-related problems. But generally, these are not allergies. These are adverse drug reactions, delirium, GI bleeds, hypoglycemia, renal failure, these types of things. And when you look at what's causing these repeat adverse drug events, it's not surprising. It's, it's what people are commonly on. So again, we don't need to relearn medicine. We just perhaps need to figure out how to monitor and deal with these medications in a, a better way. So it's not surprising, again, that when we looked at medication classes that caused these, this is very much consistent with the last slide, but it's generally the anticoagulants. Interestingly enough, opiates figure prominently in this and uh, medications used to, to treat diabetes. So diabetics and renal failure are generally patients who are quite high risk, and so these are patients that we should be looking at. We've got numerous case, um, uh, sort of cases in our case series of patients who have known established renal failure and they're on medications like prosoprolol that are known to accumulate as the kidney function declines and at one point in time, they tip over and they present with bradycardia and hypotension to the emergency department. So these are the types of issues that we're seeing. Okay, just, I'm going to just tell you, so as we learned about this finding, we started digging around in the literature. And this is something that is relatively new in the literature that hasn't really um, been widely described. There's one pilot study from Holland that was able to find that when an elderly patient presented to hospital and was admitted for an adverse drug event, they had a 25% chance of being back on the culprit drug within 180 days. This is really relatively 
sort of a new finding, and so that's why we haven't really developed systems to try and prevent this occurrence. So why is that happening? And I'm just going to, does anybody have a, an idea or a hunch of why we might unintentionally be doing this? Sorry, Corinne, I'm going to... Go gonna, ahead. I'm just gonna, yeah, thanks for letting me work on your project. It's actually really interesting for, for someone who really does not have that much experience to get a tremendous amount of exposure. But it's the communication. When you work in the community, often, you know, I think a lot of times when you admit a patient for an adverse drug event, I think sometimes physicians are reluctant to put adverse drug event as a, as a primary diagnosis for one thing. It's just easier to put delirium and YD rather than totally. this was a major culprit or it's buried at the bottom of a 12 page geriatric consultation. Yep. And if you're a, and it's also just with fragmentation of community and primary care, patients bounce from internist to family physician back to a different care provider, a walk-in clinic. And at that point, somebody is gonna toss them right back on a common drug that's there again. Perfect. Plus in the community setting, it's difficult to tell what access to Pharmanet people have. What did Pharmanets are? So I, I, didn't, from, I didn't feed this line to Frank. <laughs> no, you know, she really didn't. <laughs> uh, Pharmanet, for those of you who aren't from British Columbia, is, is the provincial log of every filled medication. And lots of times we're fortunate to have it in the emergency department, but in community settings and office settings, internists, cardiologists do not necessarily have this. And a patient might not be able to say, well, I'm on it because that drug caused a bad event the last time. Patients can't tell you that. And I think it's something we're reluctant as physicians to tell patients, you're in the emergency department most likely because of this medication, because it almost assigns blame to the patient, the physician who assigns it. So we stay away from that and say, well, you're, you're, little, you're a little delirious today, so we we'll have to meet at a hospital. But actually identifying the culprit you know, and now acknowledging there is a problem is the first step in dealing with a problem. So... So thanks, Frank. You've sort of summarized a whole bunch of stuff that, that I was going to go into. Yeah, so there's a, a big issue with we develop EMRs in our information systems according to the hospital that we work in. But the patient, when I, if I get admitted to hospital, I want to go home. I don't want to stay in that hospital. So my information resides within one hospital. But when I go see my GP, my GP does not have access to my hospital record. And so that's probably what's happening. So I'll just use this as an example to put a little bit of meat on the bones as to how our qualitative work, what, what it's indicating. But essentially, this is a really, really, really common case that you and I probably see once a month, I would imagine. So an elderly patient presents, is delirious and nauseous. I've had seizures as well from this. But basically, this patient was recently put on hydrochlorothiazide, one of our really common culprits, and lo and behold, the sodium is 115. So you make the diagnosis of hyponatremia. Most patients won't write secondary to hydrochlorothiazide. But hyponatremia, patients get admitted to medicine. So what happens? Well, logically, we don't re-prescribe the hydrochlorothiazide while in hospital. We fluid restrict the patient, and the sodium comes back up. And if we don't identify an alternative diagnosis, we're likely to think that this is hyponatremia due to hydrochlorothiazide. That's fine. But now when we discharge the patient, unless we actually communicate that the hydrochlorothiazide is now contraindicated, he's come in, um, the pre-existing prescription for the hydrochlorothiazide is still legally valid. The community pharmacist knows nothing about what happened in the ED or in hospital. So unless you take a prescription pad and you actually write discontinue hydrochlorothiazide and I generally write ADE hyponatremia and I sign it and I write my practice number and I date it and I put the patient sticker on it and I tell the patient please bring this to your pharmacist the pharmacist has no idea what happened and oftentimes we're discharging patients over the weekend oftentimes they'll go see their pharmacist before they go see their GP the GPs tell us when we fax them records about adverse drug events well the fax just the fax sheets just pile up and they literally told us stop faxing me I can't read them anyways and oftentimes we found cases, I had recently one where a patient presented with bradycardia due to bisoprolol, and then it was the pharmacist who said to me, did you know that one of our cardiologists just discharged this patient from the CCU? And the issue was is that the diagnosis was made, but it was buried in a three-page consultation note. So unless the GP or whoever actually subsequently saw the patient got and read through three pages of consultation notes, there's no chance that that person would have known. And the patient still had AFib. So the patient still needed a drug to rate control them. They just couldn't have a drug that was excreted by the kidneys, or they needed a pacemaker on top of that. So the issue is really that 
are prescribing guidelines for patients who have chronic disease, they keep pushing us to re-prescribe that first-line drug. Same thing is true for diabetics, it's true for hypertensive um, patients, it's true for AFib patients, and so we keep having this pressure to manage and treat the chronic disease, and we don't know about the adverse drug event. So what was not surprisingly commonly associated with repeat adverse drug events, and these are just descriptive because we didn't want to get into multiple testing issues, but just descriptively, it appeared that this inadequate reassessment after restarting a drug was this common theme. So when you restart the beta blocker, when you restart the hydrochlorothiazide, there's no reassessment after that. We had just assumed that the patient would do okay after that. And then the other thing was is that this critical information about the previous history was just missing. So obviously all of these data are limited. Um, these are retrospective data, so you have to think about things like information bias and measurement bias, which are absolutely there. But we think that this is the only way we can start digging into this problem and identifying what solutions could possibly be there. Um, Looking back, this is by far and away the largest sort of look, the largest, if you so want, um, case series of this type of a problem. And so what we feel that we learned from this study is that ADEs in retrospect are commonly preventable. Repeat ADEs are really far more common than we think is reasonable, and they're way more common than errors. And so... What do we do next? We're still stuck with this. We haven't touched this problem. We haven't identified any solutions. We haven't even touched the health services, like the burden that's of patients coming into our acute care systems, let alone the patients and families who are suffering from these problems. So we started thinking, like Frank, about, well, what's causing this? And it's exactly as Frank described. So when I see the 85-year-old delirious patient, I see her in a hospital setting, and I document hydrochlorothiazide-induced hyponatremia on my M15. Hopefully somebody can read it. Now I dictate it. I try to send it to the other care providers, but many of my colleagues don't dictate. And even if I send it to the GP, the community pharmacist still doesn't know, the endocrinologist doesn't know, the cardiologist doesn't know, the nurse practitioner doesn't know, home care doesn't know. And so it's exactly like Frank said. So we now have a delirious patient who can't remember a thing about her presentation, who can't keep five medications apart, doesn't know which of the five was the problem, but we rely on the patient to somehow convey all that information to the community-based practitioners that that patient is seeing and the outpatient pharmacy. Now what we do have, it's exactly like Frank said, we have this secure, established link between the medication dispenses and the outpatient pharmacy. So the outpatient pharmacy, they actually can't bill for the, they don't get paid unless they enter a medication into Pharmanet. That's how they bill the government for the hydrochlorothiazide that this patient would be receiving. And we see that information, but we have no ability to enter information into that database. And so what we're currently trying to do is we're trying to program a data entry interface that's very quick, very rapid, that allows you within several clicks of the mouse to basically click hydrochlorothiazide when you do a BPMH or when you look at the medication dispensing data and using two or three drop down menus it allows you to go hyponatremia which maps it to ICD-10 codes and once that is confirmed what we think should really happen is that that data actually needs to be stored with the Pharmanet data it needs to be tagged with the Pharmanet data because that way as the Pharmanet data, once it's housed within the Pharmanet database, outpatient pharmacies can actually get it. And because they have to enter the medications into Pharmanet, that can act as a hard stop for them if we can send what we are going to call a patient-specific medication level alert. So if Frank's the person who had this problem, I only want to get an alert if Frank comes to see me and I'm dispensing the hydrochlorothiazide. I don't want to get any alerts about any other medications or any other patients. None of this generic ANSEF and probenicid flagging because I'm very likely to ignore that flag because it's clinically irrelevant for 99.9% .9 of my patients. But what I want is a very specific alert that 
Eric had this problem and he bled on this drug and therefore I really shouldn't give it to him unless I'm very, very carefully considering the consequences. And so we think that that type of problem could break this cycle. And this is an example of what such a really brief alert could look like. And this is the kind of thing that if, if we can actually do this, and the ministry will do this with us, that you might end up seeing on the very top of your FireMinute printout. And if we can hyperlink our software to, for example, Cerner or Meditech in the Fraser system, that you could actually get that very specific alert when you're actually prescribing electronically or when your pharmacist is dispensing medications. All right. So I'll kind of leave it up to you as to what you think the future holds and what you think we can do with the current safety initiatives that we know are going to be implemented. Um, and I hope that we will really achieve this goal together that has been set out for all of us regionally, because I think it's a, it's a very important goal that we really do need to achieve, especially when we start talking about health system sustainability, let alone what our patients go through. So I will leave you with, with the thoughts that sort of come to mind when I think about this. So I think we really need to be careful when we start thinking about system level interventions and we need to take the time to look at epidemiological data before we spend millions and millions and millions pushing interventions that we're not sure what how common they are and what the effectiveness of the intervention is that we're pushing. We know that this is a problem that we probably can prevent. And based on our data, repeat ADEs would probably be the single biggest target for intervention if we can find solutions to how to do it. And hopefully we'll see better effectiveness of CPOE and MedRec than we have in the past. I'm very hopeful for that. And in the interim, before we've got Cerner and those fancy systems, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of tips that I try to convey to the learners that I work with. And it's basically ask, not just about allergies, but I generally ask a very broad question. Have you ever had problems with your medications? And it does take more time, so you do have to leave a little bit of time for it because, unfortunately, some patients can be long-winded. It's very easy to ignore the light headache on the CCB and tell them, you know, move on, please. But I think you really do need to understand whether or not the patient has previously had an adverse event, especially when you're giving a prescription for a drug that could make them bleed. Um, I shouldn't have written, don't ask about allergies. I, I don't want you to not ask about them, but just ask it more broadly. And then um, the thing that I now do is I just try to spend a little bit more time. And at VGH, we have access to geriatric nurses. And because our geriatric patient population is a big patient population that really is at risk here, I ask the geriatric nurses to go over all my discharge instructions with them. And I ask them, and I often give the patient a copy, you know, a discontinue order. I give it to them in their hand. And I often will write a note to the GP, please see this patient with an X, or I dictate that so that I can make sure that the GP gets that. And I'll often actually give a patient a copy of my dictation hoping that somebody in the family can read it with them or reinforce the instructions. All right, I'm going to leave you with that. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your comments, disagreements. Nick. Oh. Um, so I was just wondering, because uh, the pharmacists and, like, you know, spend a great time on those med rec sheets. So can... Yeah, it's press. Yeah. Okay, um, so we spend a lot of time, um, and like some of the pharmacists spend a lot of time filling out those medication reconciliation sheets with the like continue, discontinue, and write out the adverse events. I was just wondering, does that get fed back to the PharmaNet system? No, it Because it would seem like a great, like, because it's, you know, all that data it discontinuing, you could just feed back and discontinue it off. Their system. Yeah, it's a huge issue. So PharmaNet was designed in the 80s as a system for outpatient pharmacies to bill the government and get reimbursed. It wasn't designed as a clinical information system. So that's part of why it's so hard, or it's been so hard, to really get that bi-directional work going. But there's more and more recognition that that does need to happen. I can tell you that nationally, through Canada Health InfoWay, um, Canada Health InfoWay, which is an organ it's a not-for-profit uh, national organization in Canada, that looks at the adoption of electronic health system solution. And 
they're really pushing for what we would call electronic medication hubs in each province, where basically you would have that type of BPMH within that electronic hub that could be fed in both ways. It's a great point. Eric. Thanks, Corinne. I always like hearing your talk. Um, can, you, can you just, so one comment that in, in the Cerner world, when a patient is discharged, they will, they will have a header in the discharge summary of medications to continue taking, medications that were changed, and medications to stop changing, and new medications. So, and that information will also go to the family doctor and whoever else you CC on it. It doesn't go to the pharmacy, and that's why your, your stuff is so important. Can you just talk about the commonest kind of, you know, as, as a practicing emergency physician, when I see someone with weak and dizziness or whatever, what, what are the, besides the warfarin and the bleed and the doac and the bleed, what are the commonest, you know, kind so, of interactions that you see? That so interactions are very uncommon. Okay. Interactions generally cause less than 2% of all the adverse drug events. That's one of the sort of, another sort of yeah. myth that we have. But the common stuff, honestly, it's over-management of high blood pressure coming, patients coming in hypotensive, it's patients coming in bradycardic, it's patients bleeding, it's patients coming in with low sugars. We see a lot of patients on statins, and we wonder whether their weakness is related to statins, 90-year-olds after they've had their STEMI. Um, there's a lot, this huge list of medications that cause delirium. I had the other day one on five different um, narcotics, benzos, another sleeping pill, I think a seizure drug and an antidepressant who came in with delirium. There's a ton of medications that cause delirium. There's a lot of medications that make people fall. The narcotics we see very, very commonly, even in the elderly. Um, I, I'll have to give you like our main results figure of our paper. But it's, it's unfortunately, it's the stuff that you commonly see. It's, it's the narcotics, the benzos, the blood pressure drugs, and it's generally too much of those drugs for patients who are taking them and they are elderly. In the mental health population, it's generally people not taking the drugs that they were prescribed. Sorry to not be more specific, but that's... Frank, did you have another sort of... You did a lot of chart reviews. It, you know, there's a lot of mental health. When, it's, when substance abuse is involved, it's always hard to determine how much of it is substance abuse, how much of it is mental health. So a lot of those we kind of flushed out. But, you know, generally it's elderly, generally it's substance abuse, and it's sort of the sick, young patients with chronic disease, with cancer, with IBD... Uh, those types of diagnoses. Sorry, I don't know. No? Okay. Just going back to the slide you had with the percentages breakdown. Um, so some of these are pretty, like, definite adverse drug events, like, you know, the, the person taking the NSAID who gets a GI bleed. But I'm just wondering about the gray zone ones where it's an yeah. elevate, uh, too high or too low a dose so the patient yeah. didn't take their medication. How do you plan on documenting those in the system? Because, you know, say it's their dose of their hydrochlorothiazide that then predisposed them to getting the severe hyponatremia, how do you document, are you documenting the full dose in the context of, Perfect. you know, renal failure or whatever so, else was going on for absolutely. that patient at the time? So what we did is we did, so we've done four different things to figure out what actually needs to be communicated and documented, and that's how we've developed what we call a minimum required data set. The first thing we did is we did a systematic review of the world's literature on adverse drug event reporting. The poor postdoc. Anyways, she reviewed 108 uh, adverse drug event reporting systems worldwide. And from that, what we identified is we identified 33 concepts or types of data that are commonly reported or that people like Health Canada or EMRs could ask for. And then what we did is we took those fields. It was really quite cool. We, we um, paid lunch for the pharmacists at different hospitals. And we said to them... We want you to sort this data and tell us what you really need to make a clinical decision. Currently, what's in Pharmanet is this 96 free text character field. You can put in whatever you want in there. So the other day I had one. It said codeine phosphate. I just can't make a decision based on that. If it's a bit of nausea, that's really easy to deal with. But if it's something really serious, well, then I really don't want to re-expose the patient. So that's how we identified. I think I actually I think I threw these in. Sorry, my slides are a bit disorganized because I was at the ministry yesterday. But I'm just going to flip to the very back. Ah, shoot. I punted myself out. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put it in. But, oh, here we go. So this is just a, a very sort of 
this is not how it's going to look like, but it gives you a sense of the idea of the types of data that we think that we need. So we kept on telling the pharmacists, remember, if you want to know the information, you also have to be willing to report it. People don't want to spend a lot of time on reporting, but they want to know the information to make a clinical decision. So these were the types of data that they thought, ideally, they would want to know. So they want to know the type of event it is. It's really important to not label everything an adverse drug reaction, and that's what most DMRs do. They call everything an adverse drug reaction. Well, if it's a, if we see a lot of young patients who bounce between our hospitals with seizure disorders, and they miss two or three doses, and they seize. And they cause a huge, it's one of the common themes that we saw in seizure patients. They run out of their medication, they seize, they go to the next eMERGE, or they get brought in because they seize on the street. And so that's really an issue related to noncompliance that, again, it's, it's preventable. It just the, the patient really needs to just take their seizure medications. Now, imagine, imagine this were me, and somebody entered Dilantin as an adverse drug reaction into my Pharmanet profile. Nobody would ever give me Dilantin again, and I'd be seizing more. So we quickly realized that the labeling is really, really important. It really needs to be labeled either as an adverse drug reaction or noncompliance. It needs to be labeled appropriately. When problems related to dosing happen, and we commonly see that in AFib patients with their beta blocker dosage, where they're either overmanaged or undermanaged. And so if patients are consistently coming in with heart rates of 130, short of breath with chest pain, and they're just inadequately treated without having any episodes of bradycardia, what that needs to be labeled as is low dose. And so that's why we have fields where you can actually enter the dose at which the problem occurred if it was a dosing issue, and you can actually enter a treatment recommendation. And what's really, really important is it's dated. Pharmacists need to know who, who made that diagnosis so that they can actually trust the information. They don't want to know, they, you know, they want to be able to page me and go, or page the GP ideally, or call the eMERGE pharmacist and say, Simon, did you have a question? It looks I like question oh, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. I probably talked too much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just a question about goalposts and what you're looking at in the, going forward. We know drugs are part of what we do. We know that, for example, if we have ten people with chest pain, giving them arsenic, four will feel better. You know, there's <laughs> a study that shows that. But obviously, it's not a great thing. We miss. We accept a 1% to 2% risk rate or miss rate in PE, ACS. What is that number, 4,518 or, or 14? I can't remember which one it was. Where, where's, where's the number that you're going to be happy at? So if we don't know how many of those deaths are actually preventable, but if the data, if the preventability figures of around two-thirds apply to the people who die, there should be about two-thirds of the deaths that may be preventable, like the guy that I saw who had a warfarin-induced hemorrhage with the elevated INR. So if those data are generalizable, which we don't know yet, because we, we don't have enough deaths that we've captured due to Your adverse drug events, we will say that with really high confidence. So, I mean, I'd be happy if we can just start working on some of these